Hello, everyone. It is July 27, year 2021, 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and I am your host, Professor Hamamoto. I'd like to welcome Trappist Skunk, Horsense, Horsense 222, Maureen 5, Glow A Smile, Michael Charlie, Rita Phillips, Corky Goss is here, yes. And I'd also like to welcome all the new subscribers or supporters on the Patreon. You're all welcome to support me there. I'm growing by leaps and bounds. The subscriptions don't show that on, on YouTube, and I'd like to address that in a moment. Uh, there are all these synthetic um, snap experts that are uh, coming on board, which is intended to uh, dilute the um, the talent pool. And yeah, there are a lot of talented people on YouTube, uh, but there are a lot of people who are, um, uh, let's just put it charitably, less than talented. And I'd like to address that right off uh, before we get into the heart of the discussion. And if you don't mind, uh, if you're new to this, you know that I always interject uh, a good uh, quotient of uh, my own particular professional and personal uh, experience in these areas. I'm not just a, a YouTube desk jockey who sits back and reads uh, other uh, YouTube or, or looks at other YouTubes and reads material online and comments on that and call that research. You have the wrong channel uh, in that case because I, and I mean no um, offense to those of you who have referred me to this guy named Professor Dad. I checked him out. This guy's a clown. <laughs> so I guess what's happening is that now that my channel is gaining some traction and a lot of serious attention, there's some serious uh, heavy, heavy, heavyweight people who are watching this and don't want to admit it. Uh, they're the future plagiarists. These are the people that are going to be writing books on these these areas that I'm opening up. I have so many new insights. I can't handle them, them myself. So I put it on YouTube, hoping that you will pick up on it or anybody. It's okay. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. Uh, my my uh, previous method was before the age of YouTube and before the internet was um, not because I was hoarding this information, but I held it back from myself. I never gave it to my colleagues because they were the worst. Those are the people that I had to really guard myself against because they were always really interested in uh, finding out what, what I was doing. And uh, then they would use it and then they turn around and try to uh, sit on any sort of merit or promotion I might get or make uh, defamatory comments about my my competency, not just my professional competency, but other um, aspects of uh, my persona. And that goes with the territory. If you're really good, there are going to be people who are uh, less than uh, talented who will go at you this way. But I will just tell you straight out, I'm really uh, offended and insulted by being mentioned in the same name as a uh, professor, dad, or whoever else these ass clowns are. Um, these are people who are, who are telling me this who just don't have any discernment. So I just want to take a little bit of time for those of you who are new to the Professor Hamamoto channel. And most of you who are in the live chat already are acquainted with me. So please forgive me for tooting my horn, so to speak. But this is for the nitpickers and this is for the language police who don't think that someone like, yeah, I'm a third generation American, you know. I, under, I know the English language. So you're not looking at a trained monkey. I do. I, I'm, I know it so well. I can play with the with the language in, in a way that people like William Faulkner have done, and I've been re revisiting him lately. All right. I understand dialects and uh, accents and uh, the etymology and, and the vocabulary. So if one of you ask clowns who puts in the comment that I'm mispronouncing a banal, I should pronounce it banal. Yeah, I'm fully aware of that. I'm a third generation American. English is my first language. Yeah, dig. Okay. Oh, perhaps I should say that you dig, right? Instead of you dig. All right. So I know there's, you know, because of, um, and, and I don't mean to, you know, want to go in on you too, too harshly, because uh, towards the end of my career, I was noting more and more undergraduates who, uh, have these sort of OCD tendencies. It might be related to the vaccines. I don't know. I mean, there's literature on that. And I uh, 
was encountering more people like very close family friends, by the way, in my immediate family who had an OCD and they could never really stand anything that's out of, um, out of square, out of plumb. So one family member, for example, whenever I went to visit him, if I happened to take uh, a Kleenex out of the box, as soon as I did that, he'd run over there and make sure that the Kleenex box was squared up just exactly in the exact way he liked it. And so I'm getting a lot of this type of, um, I was getting a lot of that amongst undergraduates. They said, well, you said this. I said, well, you know, um, I don't really read verbatim out of notes like maybe you're used to. And this is not a mathematics course or a science course. And I might have misspoken. So I'm just telling you, I might misspe misspeak here. Say I just misspoke there. I might misspeak here. Uh, but save your breath, save your time, save your and Go to another YouTube channel and be a language Nazi over there, right? Same with the nitpickers. Um, so, you know, the, okay, that's enough about the uh, clickbait artists who uh, are now crowding the field, especially in the area of true crime. True crime is really in. But let me, let me just give you background. I, I'm an expert, okay? This is not me saying this. This is my professional colleagues. This is journalists who used to call me. They used to contact me for free material, for free quotations, right, when I was a hot commodity. They don't do it anymore because um, I've made sure I've gone out of my way to alienate uh, the uh, looky-loos who wanted cheap quote, right? And I was good at it. I'm very, you know, I understand how the media works. So I give really good soundbite. I'm a good memologist, too. And before, uh, what's that guy's name? The guy that... Uh, uh, infiltrated the Q movement. Um, Ali, yeah, Ali Alexander. Yeah, they, he's. I don't know what ethnicity he is now. He's probably going to uh, show up as Asian or something. But he's supposed to be, supposed to be the, the meme expert. No, no, I'm the meme expert. Not that it really matters to me. But anyway, I just want to say I am a, a certified <laughs> expert. By, by certified, I mean I have uh, books in print on it. All right, I have um, Nervous Laughter, 1989. Monitored Peril, 1994. Do I need to go on, right? And um, so I, you know, I paid my dues, and I, I have uh, high standing. I, I taught at the UCLA School of Film, Television, and Theater. They hired me for a year, and then they brought in some other ass clown who never really produced anything after that. Uh, they, that's how it rolls in, in uh, most of these institutions. If you're a little bit too good or ahead of the pack, it's the old crab syndrome, right? They'll pull you back in the crab barrel. But hey, that that's that's the price you pay. I'm not complaining about it. I'm just explaining uh, how these how hard fought these insights that I'm about to share with you, how hard fought they are in um, in acquiring them and disseminating them, right? Because you're not going to get any. Uh, and I'm not. I don't work for 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 kudos and, and, and plaudits and, and awards, right? Or it merits or promotion. I write it, I write these, this material because I identify with the, the William Falk. I'm not comparing myself to him, but I identify with the William Faulkners of the world who feel that they have a very strong message that they want to share with other people. And if people want to pick up on it, fine. If they don't, they can just nitpick. I read a really awful book uh, about Faulkner and his uh, supposed uh, racism, right? Quote, unquote. From the perspective, of course, of uh, 2020, I think he's brilliant. And I don't even think he was talking so much about the South as he was about human destiny. He was he was interested in the big picture, not just the regional Oxford, the Apokonopta County or whatever his fictional world was. He was interested in... Um, in the human universe, the human experience, and I reckon it's, it's some of his work's difficult to go through, but I, I believe it's it's well worth it. And and the reason I'm going back to it because I think William Faulkner has a lot to to tell us about what's going down in 2021 on a prophetic level, on a profoundly prophetic level, because he understood the human condition, he understood the the metaphysics of history and the human experience. And I got to read more about what he was looking into, what his reading list was back when he was coming up, right? I know he was very much in tune with the currents of modern literature from James Joyce and Virginia Woolf and all the mo literary modernists and those people. 
uh, and to do so, I think he was uh, he was like the librarian at the uh, University of Mississippi. He never finished college, by the way. So this is not about being uh, someone who has gone through formal education or having an advanced degree. Don't get me wrong on that, right? Uh, it turns out to, that uh, most of the people who I like uh, had had <clears throat> departed from the uh, formal education track, and with good reason. <clears throat> Excuse me for a moment. <clears throat> Another good example who I've also been revisiting is um, F. Scott Fitzgerald, who uh, went to Princeton, as many people know, but never finished, right? And thank, thank goodness he didn't, <laughs> because we're left with a huge legacy of material that need, need to be revisited. All right. Uh, again, I'm not putting myself in this category. That's for future generations to determine. But I have let, left a, a, a published legacy, and I'm doing the YouTubes because this is the way. This is the modern, the contemporary method of reaching the pop public that people like F. Scott Fitzgerald were, um, well, they were un unable to, to avail themselves. They had the magazines like Saturday Evening Post or the Atlantic Monthly publications of their day, and they were very well paid for it. But there was, um, I mean, they barely made it into the age of radio, let alone television. So I would be a fool if, it, if I did not avail myself of this wonderful technology. I'm a YouTube fan. I'm a YouTube junkie. I like it. Just before or during the course of this uh, pre preparing here, I was looking at um, tutorials on how to play claw hammer guitar. Yes, I think I'm going to make the jump into claw hammer guitar. You've heard of claw hammer banjo? Well, claw hammer guitar is what I'm really interested in. So anyway, the point is I'm into YouTube, even though they don't like it when I mention certain words or, or broach certain topics. But in, in doing so, or because of that, I can broach these topics sideways by talking about people such as today's topic, Rodney James Alcala, or Alcala, as some people pronounce it. If you're an anal retentive uh, language Nazi, um, you know, I, I will say uh, Rodney James Alcala. I think that's how he, he liked to have it pronounced because indeed he might have been uh, a, a descendant from some sort of royal Spanish uh, Iberian uh, Saxe Gotter Coburg uh, royal house. I suspect he was. He, he was not born Rodney James Alcala or Al, I'll say Alcala. All right. Can I speak like an Anglo Alcala? Rodney James Alcala. All right. I'll say Los Angeles or uh, I'll, or a British Los Angeles instead of Los Angeles. Is that better for you? OK. All right. You get my point. Right. Stop nitpicking. Right. Pull, pull it out. You know, pull the thumb out of your you know what. And and listen, if you have something substantive to say about my talk, I'm interested in hearing it. Rodney James Alcala was not that was not his name, even though he was tried as such, convicted, and imprisoned, and he was he was serving a life prison, concurrent life prison, um, life sentences at Corcoran State Prison. Uh, let's see, Charles Manson was there. Uh, I'll, I'll have a whole list of people, and I think the fact that all these celebrity uh, killers were there is meaningful. And I have a personal anecdote that I'll share with you in, in a moment. But to, to finish this point about Rodney James, and this is an insight here that's original, all right? Follow up on it. Some plagiarist is probably going to take it and run with it. But I'm giving it to you because this is information that that belongs to everybody. It's just a matter of whether you you have the eyes to see and the ears to hear, right? I have this cultural forensic perspective that goes deep into the culture. And one of the main elements of my analytical strategy or technique is looking at bloodlines, right? People call it genetics, right? Genetics is another way of talking about bloodlines. However, it's a, a genetics is strictly uh, two-dimensional, right? Um, when you talk about bloodlines, it's three, four, quantum dimensional. That's why I use, prefer talking about bloodlines rather than genetics. Anyway, specifically, look this up yourself. Uh, Alcala's real name, his born, his birth name was Rodrigo Jacques. You know, why does he have a French name? Well, you know that Spain, House of Savoy, you know the families intermingled, right? 
So we think in terms of nationalities, races, ethnicity, oh, he was Mexican American, he was Spanish, blah, blah, blah. But the houses, the bloodlines don't think in those terms, okay? So again, cultural forensics tells us don't worry about the, or you know, worry about it, pay attention to nationality and all these other uh, categories that are artificially constructed after all. Look more closely at the bloodlines. So his bloodlines has, I guess, a little French in it. You know, maybe it's House of Savoy. I don't know. I haven't checked it out yet. Rodrigo Jacques Alcala Bucour. And now I've never seen that. Is that a Basque name? Maybe he's typo negative. I don't know. We, you know, I'd really like to know what his blood type is. It's probably on file someplace. I don't know if they release that information, but I'd like to know his blood type because his his birth name is um, quite uh, quite unique to say the least. And so, uh, so far as I know, I'm the only one that uh, has made a big deal out of it, right? He was born August 23rd, uh, 1943 in San Antonio, Tejas. Okay, does that help you if you know you're a native speaker of Espanol? I'm not, but I know it's San Antonio, Tejas. Right, I'll just say San Antonio or San Antonio. And he died recently. That's the reason why. And thank you very much. One of my uh, Patreon supporters uh, notified me of the death of Alcala. So thank you very much. I'll, I'm, that's why I'm doing this talk today. Because uh, it so happens that I know quite a bit about him and what he represents. That's the important part. We're going to learn from the death of one of the... Um, the, the most sinister figures that have walked the earth in recent times, Rodney Alcala. We're going to learn from that, and we're going to warn uh, ourselves and others about these types of false synthetic serial, so-called serial killers. I don't use that term because they're much more than that, and that's the perspective that I'm going to be sharing with you today. Uh, I, I call them uh, synthetic assassins or synthetic hashashins. Right, that's where the term assassin comes from. It's uh, Nizari Ismaili, right? Goes back to the 11th century, right? Goes deep, yeah. Cultural forensics is deep. So anyway, he died recently, July 24th, just a few days ago. Look at, I put a talk together right on the heels of the death of this miscreant, right? Because I've been studying it for years, finishing up my bona fides. Yeah, I wrote the books, you know, on it. Uh, most... Uh, I think relevant is a seminal landmark essay that I did. I think it was about 20 years ago. All right, I have to look look at find it. Uh, this is an academic essay that was originally published in uh, New Political Science. Later, it was anthologized in a book um, about uh, U.S. militarism. And the article that I where I talk about not just uh, Rodney James Alcala, but Richard Ramirez. Uh, there's a lot of Latinos. Latinos are overrepresented um, so far as um, non uh, uh, non Hispanic whites are or Hispanic whites are concerned. That's the census category, and there's a reason for that, which which I, hopefully I'll be able to get into. Because I don't want to pick on Hispanics or any one group. You know, people say, "Well, how come you're not talking about your own group?" Right? Which I guess means Asian. Well, I do. I wrote a book called uh, Servitors of Empire that devoted to that, and my colleagues hated me for it, uh, especially the Asian American ones, because uh, they, they want to be seen as being model citizens um, in, instead of intellectual lightweights, which uh, most of them are. And uh, one day I'm going to tell you about the Asian American studies movement and how that is a synthetic creation, just like the Black Studies movement is, synthetic. just like Latino, Latina, now it's called Latinx Studies, is a, a synthetic uh, operation that comes out of the intelligence agents, agencies. So you can't ding me on that, because very soon, I think th for Thursday, I'm going to be going in on one Charles Chitat Ng. He's a Chinese-American from Hong Kong originally, and his partner in crime named uh, Leonard Lake. And again, I'm not a desk jockey. I'm not just some uh, YouTube sit in your mama's basement uh, clickbait artist. I was in the area around the 4th of July holiday time where Leonard Lake and, and Charles Ng were doing their torture uh, murder uh, 
uh, I guess it was a compound that, that they set up. The the area, I didn't go to the area, so I mean the compound itself. It's it's almost impossible to find. I haven't been able to find it. I was trying to uh, look for it on Google Earth. Maybe you can find it. If you do, please let me know. Um, I was there for another reason, which is neither here nor there. But I was up there, and I, I scoped out the area. I've been meaning to go up there for years and years and years, and I finally got to go up there. Wilseyville, Calaveras County. You know what a Calavera is? Or if you like Calavera, Calavera means skull in Espanol, especially Mexican Spanish. It means skull, and it's part of a Spanish indigenous folklore. You know, if you know about... Um, the Day of the Dead, the Mexican Day of the Dead, Dia de los de la Muertos, right? And and you know about um, uh, the different folk languages. You've seen the skulls. Well, uh, Calaveras County was named by a Spanish explorer because he found all these skulls. They were native people. And by the way, that's one of the reasons why I think California leads the nation in serial killers, not because of our our storied colonial past of, um, of uh, España, Mexico, and also China, by the way, and Russia. California has, has been occupied by any number of groups. So I don't know what all the, um, the fuss is about chat cops taking over, because they were here back in 1492 already. There was Chinese uh, vessels found nearby where I am in the, in the Sacramento um, uh, Delta area. And here comes our friend, the, the mighty leaf blower, right? <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, so yeah, I mean, I I want to remain a sovereign nation. Believe me, I'm not. I haven't thrown my lot in with the Chacoms. You know, I don't like that. What's going on in that department either? However, uh, most of my colleagues and most of the University of California threw in their their lot, threw their lot in with with the with the Chacom takeover a long time ago. I've talked about that in other contexts, so I'll leave that where it is. So I lectured uh, quite a bit, and writ I've written quite a bit about the serial killer phenomenon, and I'll just use serial killer as a, just as a phrase of convenience here rather than synthetic hashashin, which I prefer. And uh, I lectured about Richard Ramirez. Uh, if you want to check out a really good book, it's called The Night Stalker, subtitled The Disturbing Life and Chilling Crimes of Richard Ramirez. It's by Philip Carlo. And it's interesting to me, well, maybe I'll get back to it later, because I really want to talk about the meaning of um, Rodney James Alcala and, and the influence that he's had, uh, not just amongst fame whores on YouTube, who are now getting into true crime, but in the larger political realm, in the historical realm, he's had a huge impact, which I'll explain in a moment. And this is something that the fame whores on YouTube are unable to uh, conceive of. Uh, they like a little bits of information and in local color, but they're not really interested in the big why question, W-H-Y. Who, what, where? Yeah, really good on that, but why? No, they don't go there. And that's also the, uh, the, the big flaw of journalism. That's why I didn't go into journalism. That's why I went the academic route, because the real quest is to find out the reasons behind phenomena. Explanation is what we do. The why question, motivation. And by the way, you're entitled to speculate. You're entitled to present hypotheses. You're entitled to make conjectures. All right. Uh, but And they can be refuted. That's really part of the science methodology. You put forward hypotheses. They could be wrong. However, they could be spot on. And once they are, my gosh, you know, we can move to the next level of understanding and explanation. And this isn't this, like I mentioned earlier, this is not a sterile intellectual exercise. This is meant for me, at least the way I approach it, as a warning to understand synthetic phenomena, synthetic crime, engineered disaster, right? Who benefits? Cui bono? Everybody knows that who reads YouTube and, and thinks they know about the new world order. Cui bono, right? That's one of the first lessons you learned. Um, Besides the, the the buzzwords of Rockefeller or Rothschild, yeah, I'm sick of reading about Rockefeller and Rothschild. You never read about the the House of Clockwork Orange Nassau, do you? <laughs> well, maybe you should check it out like I am. If you understand world history in terms of Ibero-Asian colonization, then the House of Clockwork Orange Nassau is right front and center. 
the Rothschilds, let alone the Rockefellers, are Johnny Come Latelys, so far as that's concerned. So already you got a big insight here. All the plagiarists, all the biters. I give this to you, Professor Dad. Welcome to the world of YouTube. Uh, you're going to be playing catch up unless you can cater to the people who have zero discernment and confuse me with you, which I think is probably the reason why you've been put out there on YouTube. All right. So that's my cultural forensics that comes straight out of a 20 year plus teaching career at the University of California, Davis. All right. You dig? I'm sorry. You dig? Yeah, I can enunciate and pronounce just like the best of them. Yes, indeed. Um, yeah, 20 years plus, and this doesn't even include the time I spent at UCLA, NYU, you know, blah, blah, blah. You don't want to know my curriculum vitae, do you? But I have to tell you this, because I do not want you to confuse me with the ass clowns, all right? It, it hurts my feelings. I might have to leave YouTube, man. <laughs> I might leave it anyway if, if they don't get rid of me first. Uh, so join my Patreon group. You're going to get regular po postings. You're going to get musings. You're going to get further. You're going to get amplifications of what I'm talking about here. This is just the tip of the iceberg that I'm presenting here. This is, a, if you want to call it, it's an infomercial, right? Not really. It's a self-contained piece. But I want you to, to get, you know, what, $5 a month? That's really not the point. I want you to get the documents. Because I can't load it here on YouTube. I can't load it on Facebook. I can load uh, attachments, PDFs. I can even do audio files, you know, short pieces, which I've been doing lately, by the way, for those of you who are on Patreon. I'm, I've been giving um, some readings, reading some material in, into the record for your use. And I don't just use it to, to put links in and, and to refer you to other other. Uh, websites and YouTube deal. I rarely do that unless it's really, really important. And I also post hard to find articles. I'll give you an example. I found a book on Walter Bosson, who was part of the Dutch diaspora. Remember I talked about the uh, clock, uh, the House of Clockwork, Orange Nassau? Well, the Afrikaners are part of that. I know we're supposed to feel sorry for them because the British uh, colonial people treated them as less than human, but that doesn't make them automatically good the good guys, you understand that subtlety, right? It's not a matter of oh, good people, bad people. No, they're. I'm interested in in the the shades of of evil in there. So Walter Busson is the medical doctor who is very much involved with uh, the creation, the engineering of of CBW chem chemical biological weapons, right? South African National. So uh, yeah, so that's I can't post it here, you know. So I I put it on Patreon. Um, and it's still up there. I'm going to take it down uh, fairly soon for because uh, I don't want to violate anybody's uh, copyright. And I don't put uh, entire books up there. I just put s some excerpts. It's called Fair Use. And sometimes I'll read, them, read the little preface, which I find is uh, very effective. I'm just experimenting with that lately. And it's thanks to the Patreon people that push me forward and ask the questions and and um, and point me in, in different directions. So you're going to have that that type of access too. So uh, yeah, I think yeah. And talking, I'm going to do Leonard Lake and Charles Ng this coming Thursday. It's an extension of this talk that I'm giving here. And then the following week, that's the week of the uh, August 6th and August 9th anniversaries. This, these are the A bomb attacks on first on Hiroshima in August 6th. And then Nagasaki on uh, August 9th. And again, I'll give you a preview. And I'll just this separates me from Professor Dad and other SNAP experts in the true crime genre, right? Everybody's an expert on true crime because it's a they read it and they think they're a researcher, right? Well, I've been reading it, but that doesn't make didn't make me research until so I started writing and producing my own true crime work, right? My true crime scholarship, if you want to call it. But just to brag on myself a little bit more, I would lived in Hiroshima for a year. I wrote about it for a publication in LA for the entire year leading up as a prelude to the 50th anniversary of the bombing of, of Hiroshima. And um, I went back to Hiroshima for the 50th anniversary. I was at the ceremony. I got a press pass from the Hiroshima city government to cover it. 
Do you understand? And I wrote an article that was got a front page cover of at the LA um, Weekly magazine in Los Angeles, right? And uh, the people that kicked me out of UCLA, uh, thinking that I was a little bit too incendiary because I predicted the LA riots and the teaching assistants that were supposed to be helping me were ratting me out. They said, oh, Professor Hamamoto's predicting race riots and hate between black and Latinos and, uh, and white people. Of course, most of the victims were Asian. They conveniently forgot that. And as a result, they didn't renew my contract. But one of them said, after that, they said, we should have hired, we should have kept you. You came out with an incredible book, Monitored Peril, and you were writing that series from Hiroshima. Why didn't you tell us that? I said, I did, but you didn't get it. Plus, you want you had some other mediocrity in the wings. Anyway, enough bitterness for now. The point is that I paid my dues. I've been to Hiroshima. I've written about it. I have some alternative theories that I will present to you coming from left field, and you can decide whether they're legitimate, valid, or need to be uh, followed up on. And I'm also going to tie it into the more the third attack on Japan, which is known as the uh, Fukushima uh, disaster, right, which is ongoing, by the way. And um, everybody's fixated on a certain type of attack that we're being treated to right now, treated as in trick-or-treat. I mean that ironically. It's no treat at all, right? I'm not going to mention the word. <clears throat> But maybe, hey, do you think it could be a distraction from a larger attack, such as radiation, right, that's blanketing the entire globe consistently for years now, that's going to be hitting the uh, elite bodies of athletes, world-class athletes in the Tokyo Olympics? Gosh, I wonder, you know, if this is a, a biological experiment that's that's taking place well we'll talk about that not next week or, um not thursday but the following week i have all kinds of uh insights on on that that spin off of the the um my experience in uh, hiroshima right okay let's go right into with the, with the second part of this talk right into uh, rodrigo jacques alcala bocur i'm mispronouncing his name i think he might be Basque. Right, and, and as you know, the Basque language is an anomaly. People, the linguists can't figure, where did it come from? You know, it just bears no relationship to all the neighboring language groups. It's, it's unique linguistically. That's what I understand. And, and they're also, and the uh, geneticists or the bloodline uh, scientists, as I call them, are baffled about why there's so much, uh, a certain blood type that comes out of the Basque people. I think... Rodney Alcala might be of that bloodline. It's worth checking up on. If you have a science background, you're especially welcome to uh, contribute. I implore you to contribute because um, <laughs> the science, I am a person uh, who respects the sciences. I don't stop there, but so don't get me wrong. We need the geneticists, the scientists, the engineers, the IT people in order to, to um, add to the research. Uh, findings here in order that, to uh, free us from further enslavement and to uh, to push back on the forces of oppression. And that's what the uh, serial killer phenomenon is about. It is a, is a weapon. All right. First of all, as an aside, I told you I was going to bring in some uh, autobiographical elements, let's call it. I mentioned Charles Manson as having been uh, a longtime prisoner in, in uh, Corcoran State Prison, where Rodney James Alcala was, I think he spent most of his prison term there until he died a few days ago. Uh, it's one of the roughest uh, state prisons in the system, if not the most. I think maybe Pelican Bay might be be a little bit tougher, but Corcoran is, is no cakewalk. And uh, for a time in, during the mid to late 80s, it, it made national headlines for being the worst uh, prison specific prison in the entire U.S. based on the number of people who were murdered, uh, rioting, and and uh, all kinds of abuses that were mostly done by the administration, abuses that were going on in the in Corcoran specifically, but also throughout the entire California state prison system. Here's where the autobiographical element comes in. I met, and, and this is, this satis hopefully it'll satisfy people who don't think 
who think that uh, you know I don't go in on my own my own people. You're my own people, by the way. <laughs> Human beings are my own people, right? Uh, but people say, oh well, you know, what about the what about the uh, the comfort woman of Japan? You know, well, yeah, that's let's let the Japanese people handle that one, right? But Jerry Onomoto, who is a fellow Japanese American, he's a Nisei. He, he would be like in my father's generation, right? He was the fourth director of the California State Prison System. All right, that's a piece of trivia. But I met him. I met him in an event at the Japanese American Citizens League down here in Florin, California, which is in the Sacramento area. He was there. He's been married to an African American woman, and she was part of the. I don't know, they probably met on the job or something. She was, maybe she was a, a jailer. Who, and she lives in Sacramento, by the way. And as a power couple, they represented themselves as a, a as an emblematic, uh, race-free, race colorblind mixed uh, couple. You know, you've got African-American and a Japanese-American couple, and that's supposed to be uh, an example for, for us, you know, the, you know, whoever us is, right? And, um, you know, I never bought it then. I don't buy it now because I really don't care. <laughs> it doesn't matter to me, right? So leave your own private uh, fetishes uh, to yourself. Anyway, the point is, is that Jerry Anomoto was the head jailer of the whole system when people like Charles Manson and Rodney Alcala and Richard Ramirez, and there's another number of people. I have a whole list here. Let's take a look at some of the people, the former prisoners. You might remember them. Juan Corona, yeah, Mexican American. I'm not picking on anybody. You know, <laughs> there, there are evil people in all the different groups all around the world too. And, you know, but I know America the best because I'm a third generation American. Uh, I'll, you might know uh, the name of Serhan Serhan, Serhan Bishara Serhan. Is that a good Palestinian accent for you? I hope uh, Mr. ADHD, who can make a comment on it, I hope that satisfies you. Uh, but he is the supposed assassin of Robert Kennedy down in L.A. right after he found he won the California state primary. He was looks like he was heading towards the White House, Robert Kennedy, another one of our martyred uh, Kennedy family members. And uh, I don't have to go through the story of Sir Hans. It's been written about extensively. The point is he was at Corcoran. And he was a mind-controlled person, just like Alcala and uh, Richard uh, Ramirez and, and most most of the other ones. Very few of them are organic. Most of them are synthetic, which I'll get to before I finish this talk, because it's really important to understand these figures as part of a larger system, as part of a larger pattern. And uh, it's becoming wide enough known and accepted as, it, as no longer just a hypothesis, but a working uh, argument to the point where these people are gonna this this serial killer phenomenon is probably going to die down, but it's going to be replaced by a new technique or or modus operandi uh, because the serial killer uh, phenomenon has been going on for about forty years, and we've finally been able to figure out what's behind it, and it's the deep state, <laughs> right? It's it's the it's the intelligence agencies. Read the book, Chaos. I talked about it in a previous talk, right? It talks about how Charles Manson and the Manson family were part of this larger CIA slash FBI program to put these people on the street, uh, not just to create terror in the, in the larger population so that we beg and plead for more police protection, but also to kill people who were talking too much. They had inside knowledge or, or privy to some sort of secrets that, that could not get out there. So they'd say, oh, we'll just, we'll just mobilize X, Y, or Z. There's an army of them. You know, maybe this is pre-Super Soldier, right? You know, the program, Super Soldier program. Maybe they were testing that out. And they have one in all the different food groups, right? You want a Mexican? You want a uh, Japanese? You want a Chinese? You know, Charles Ng? You want a uh, person of Scots Irish background? You want a black person? You know, whatever tribal group can be Mundingo or, you know, Yoruba. We got it down. We've got, you know, Wayne Williams down in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. We got CQ, right? Who was part of the supposedly Symbionese Liberation Army that kidnapped the heiress, Patty Hearst? Of course, that's been proven to have been a synthetic event. We got all the different 
And this is really the, the, the main contribution of critical race theory. <laughs> Ironically, the critical race theory is really the motor that, that allowed the behavioral sciences that run these programs how to pick ethnic correct and ethnically specific, racially specific, and even religious, like Sir Han Cern. Well, Sir Han Cern was Christian, but they had the guy at the Fort Hood shooting, right? Wasn't he? Made, he was a medical doctor, Hassan, uh, forgot his name, Fort Hood, Texas, right? He was Muslim. Supposedly, he had a boner against uh, the people. So they have all these different uh, Cesar Sayak, a Filipino, right? Uh, down in the uh, Florida club. Um, uh, Dylan Roof, right, uh, Charlotte, you know, on and on. They have it all broken down. Uh, they, meaning the handlers who run the, this this larger system, they have it all broken down thanks to the insights of the academic feminists who talk about gender and racial and patriarchal oppression and the violence of uh, of male-dominant society. You know, if we could all be castrated and, and have the uh, society run by people like uh, Kamala Harris, for example, or or Hillary Clinton, there'd be no more violence, no more war, and we'd be we'd, we'd be living in in the great uh, utopian society um, envisioned by um, by the Amazons. I guess I don't know. Uh, so these are some of the characters that were in there. Uh, current uh, high profile, uh, hope, I'm sorry, high profile inmates today. The one that stuck out in my mind, and I didn't know this until I ch I checked this out, but. One of the current inmates is a guy named Joseph James D'Angelo. Now, that's a name that might not be known to you because he only recently was put in jail, right? He is today known as the Golden State Killer. Golden State as in California, right? You know, the California connection as the most evil state in the union, so far as serial killers are concerned, right? Because there's a lot of everyday people here. The majority of them are everyday people, and they keep... Um, torching their homes with these uh, forest fires, right? Whether it's in Napa or <clears throat> other parts and flooding, right? That's gonna be uh, another strategy. I'm you know, there's tons of dams everywhere you look in California, the whole, the whole state is dammed, you know, in, in both senses of the word, right? So you're gonna see a lot of uh, water damage probably in this coming winter, um, I'm predicting, because I also have psychic powers as well as analytical powers. Uh, we're, we're leaving the fires and the serial killers behind. Now it's going to be the great deluge. We almost had it a few years ago you know, up, up north of us here in one of the uh, giant dams. So, yeah, James, uh, uh, Joseph James D'Angelo supposedly had been, was the golden, the single only Golden State killer for like 20 or 30 years. And he was a policeman, right? He was up here in the, the southern or the outward outer uh, city in the Sacramento County area. Sacramento County is um, one of the sites of the, you know, the the Unabomber, Ted Dzinski, as I mentioned before, used to come here and check in with, with the people probably at the federal, the FBI office down, in downtown for all I know. He also used to go to the same bookstore, the Tower Record books where I used to go, but I never saw him that I know of. Uh, also, uh, yeah, another, before I finish up here, Another inmate at Corcoran is Philip Garrido. Remember a talk I gave about Philip Garrido and his wife out here in the uh, South Bay region of, um, of the Bay Area, East Bay, right? Him and his wife were kidnapping people and holding them as sex. So go back on, in the playlist of the Professor Hamamoto channel and, and look at Philip Garrido, another a pair of synthetic killers and slavers and sex criminals, right? So let me finish up here with uh, a, because you know about Rodney James Alcala. So let me just stick with, with an element that you might not be aware of. All right. We all know that Rodney James, he's a handsome guy, really good looking dude. You know, <laughs> he's, he's like genetically perfect guy. You know, he had it all. So you know that uh, any, well, not any, but most women, would fall for such a guy. Um, so he was on uh, the dating game show. It was a real popular show in the 70s. And its creator was a guy named Chuck Barris. Remember him? He always pretended that he was a happy-go-lucky, sort of a idiotic type of character. Uh, but according to his autobiography, Confessions of a, what is it called? Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, 
This is published, uh, God, I can't remember when, about 10 years ago. I might be wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong. But he did an autobiography. That's the key point here called uh, Confessions of a Dangerous Man. And by the way, it was later made into a film as a biopic starring George Clooney. Yeah, I know it's Clooney. I'm just having some fun here. Do you mind? Uh, and he's married to a human rights lawyer, Amal Clooney. She's a great beard for him, I'm sure. When, number one, she seems to be a woman. Secondly, she's a human rights lawyer, right? And George, you know, I don't need to go on George Clooney's background. You know more about him than I do. So anyway, Rodney Alcala was brought in on the dating game by Chuck Barris, right? He wasn't the host. He was, that was a gong show. He also, he meaning Barris was the pass through the creator, the titular creator of the gong show. Um, but he was brought in as one of three bachelors in this TV game show where this eligible a uh, woman, would, a single woman, hopefully, would come in and, and interview them. Uh, and they were off. They weren't on camera. But the audience and the television audience could see them. And they'd give their uh, – well, you watch the show. I don't want to have to explain it. Anyway, he won the contest. He was selected out of three, Rodney Alcala, because of the, the really sleazy and salacious and suggestive answer uh, answers that he was giving. And I was watching it in prep preparation for today's talk. And I realized, oh, yeah, of course, these answers were scripted for him, right? It made him seem really witty and sexy and all that, but it was all written out just like the introductions to Bachelor or the whoever it was that was coming out there, right? These are all, it's all synthetic, right? It's a, and that's not saying much, so don't bother saying that. Yeah, it's all synthetic, it's all a show. Yeah, tell me something new. Let's get into specifics, all right? Um, that's what I'm trying to do here. So he won the contest back in 1978. Uh, I mean, 19, um, yeah, 1978, but he had already been convicted of rape before he ever showed up on, on the dating game. And th that's part of public record. All the producers had to do, and they should have, is to, to check, vet him, just do just simple security check, but they didn't do it. Why didn't they do it? I think it was intentional, and it has to go with the, the background of Chuck Barris himself, right? Born, by the way, Charles Hirsch Barris, but he went by Chuck because that's a more friendly way of saying Charles, right? Hey, Chuck, Chucky, yeah, Chuck. Um, that's, a, that's a nickname here in American English. We call people whose names is Charles, we call them Chuck or Chucky, right? And I'll get into the Chucky in a moment. Chucky as in Chucky the psychopathic killer doll, right? Because that figures into this story about Rodney Alcala before I'm finished here. Anyway, Chuck Barris claims in Confessions of a Dangerous Mind that he was a CIA assassin. He says this. He says this. Now, I don't know if his claims were true, exaggerated, or he has the right agency, but the point is, is that he raised this question about his connection to the intelligence agency. He wasn't someone that just came right out of the show business area. I mean, he was probably, maybe, perhaps, right? Because he, he co-wrote a song called Palisades Park with Freddie Cannon. Check it out on YouTube. I don't want to have to sing. It's a terrible song. I hated it. Uh, but it was a, a top 40 hit. I'm sure a lot of money passed hands so that the, the, sh the song was played incessantly. I gave a previous talk on Morris Levy of, of uh, Buddha Records and also you kind of have an idea of how the American uh, record business and TV industry works. It's pretty much mobbed up, which includes intelligence agencies. We know that there's really very little distinction at the highest levels between the mob and uh, so-called uh, uh, national security uh, agencies, right? So check it out, uh, Chuck Barris. Um, yeah, speaking of uh, Palisades Park, let me just as a, as a slight digression here. Uh, you tell me and you think about it. Maybe I'll do, I'll, I'll do a talk on, on amusement parks, right? Palisades Park uh, was in the Palisades of New Jersey across from Manhattan, right? Um, New York City. And uh, I think it was 1889, 1890 or something like that. It was around for, for decades. And uh, this is before Disneyland, of course. 
and millions of, I think maybe up to, to six to 10 million would go in a single year. That at its peak time, it's gone now. It's, it's, it's went into a uh, uh, condominia type redevelopment. So far as I, I haven't been, I've never, I never went to the original Palisades Park. But anyway, he wrote this song, Freddie Cannon, and it got me to thinking, what is it about amusement parks circuses would have killer clowns in them right remember at the clown i saw the movie when it came out a couple couple uh years ago now is it and the calliope music and the tunnel of love and, and the the fun house and and later disney disney you know picked up certain uh, certain ritualistic occultic uh types of rides and attractions for its own and we know that all these places are creepy i could never stand going there i didn't like going I mean, I didn't mind the games, the carnival games at the California State Fair, but I didn't want to go on the rides. Number one, they're not very safe, uh, any of any of these rides. But they're also they're they're meant to to put you in an altered state of consciousness, and I'm sure it's a really good um, cruising grounds for uh, men primarily who have an unhealthy interest in young boys or girls, children, in other words, right. And you see this in the opening sequence to the film 1987, The Lost Boys, 1987, which takes place in the historic Santa Cruz boardwalk. And it was directed by Joel Schumacher. Check him out. He deserves an entire study unto himself. I'll let you do that work. Or maybe if I get around to it, I'll go in on Joel Schumacher, go into his sexual history and his likes and all that. He later went on to be one of you know the director of a couple of Batman shows. That's probably how you know him, the Black Batman movies, right? But before that, he had done Lost Boys, and the Lost Boys. Guess who were two of the main cast members of the Lost Boys? Yes, the two Corys, Corey Hyam and Corey Feldman. I don't need to go in into that, right? You dig in on that. You probably know more about the two Corys than I do. It later became a reality show. Uh, so yeah, these, uh, state fairs, circuses, clowns always freaked me out. Um, maybe you too. And I remember going to the state fair once, California state fair, and I saw the hypnotist. There was a hypnotist. And then they have, they have this idea that, Hey, if you're not suggestible, you have nothing to worry about. I never believed that. And sure enough, uh, there were some complaints following the appearance of this one hypnotist and, uh, they took him off the off the uh, roster of acts, right? And I think they just stayed with music or whatever else. So, yeah. Let me conclude then with how uh, Chucky, right, as in Chuck Barris, how it comes in to the picture here of uh, uh, Rodney Alcala. You know about the Child's Play franchise, right? Child's Play. The first movie was 1988. It was titled Child's Play. And after that, Six, seven, maybe more movies followed it. The first ones are pretty straightforward horror, right? And then they became kind of self-parodies. Uh, and then the most recent one, I think, went back to its root as a straight-up horror film. I think that was, uh, what, The Curse of Chucky, right? I kind of like the cheesy ones. I like any any of the Chuckies with, um, with Jennifer Tilly in it. <laughs> she, she is, so, by the way, she's a she's an ace uh, champion professional uh, poker player. She's no slouch. Um, by the way, I understand she's her her mother is, is Chinese American or something. So, hey, there you go, affirmative action. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that there's a guy named Don Mancini. Sir, I would like to meet him and interview him. I'm going to reach out and, and if I can find the information or if you can supply it to me, I'm going to ask him to be on this show and I'm going to ask him about the whole Chucky franchise. He was a film student at UCLA. I taught at UCLA. I didn't meet him there, but I was in that same school and he was a starving film uh, student like most of them are, by the way, uh, unless you had some kind of in and apparently he had a great idea. It was the old Chucky's uh, uh, franchise, right? And um, by the way, Jane, uh, Rodney Alcala, who is a brilliant and creative person, as well as being extremely handsome, 
uh, spent some time at UCLA. I think he studied photography. So gosh, maybe he m ran into Don Mancini. Who, who knows? It's a small world. Um, and, you know, we know Jim Morrison was a film student at UCLA. Now, don't go in on this whole, you know, Dave McGowan stuff. He's a limited hangout, as I've explained to you. To take us away from these original research happening now in 2021, we got to talk about, you know, Laurel Canyon and of uh, 40 years ago so that we don't deal with 2021. So Don Mancini um, came up with this concept and guess who he patterned Chucky after? Yes, it was Rodney Alcala. I don't think Mancini has ever in the interview said, yeah, I, I, I patterned uh, Chucky after Alcala. But if you watch Child's Play and if you look at all the backstories and the flashbacks of all the sequels, and I think I've seen all of them, right? They all kind of runs together at a certain point. Um, but uh, the backstory is that, you know, this evil uh, serial killer person who looks strangely <laughs> similar um, physically to Rodney Alcala, uh, lightning from heaven came, struck him. And then as, as he was trying to escape the police, um, um, I guess he's in imminent danger of being arrested, right? So in, in, he went to a toy store. And as the uh, vengeful lightning from heaven came flashing down, he happened to be holding on a doll, and, and his evil spirit went into a Chucky doll. And then you know the rest, right? Watch those. This this is cinema. I'm not being smart ass here. I think the Chucky franchise is, is uh, an incredible <clears throat> um contribution to American, if not world cinema. I think it explains, uh, it, as they come out, a lot about that contemporaneous society. I'll give you an example. Seed of Chucky is very much about the emasculated, diminished male that the academic feminists had been trying to engineer into mainstream society for, for many, many years. Seed of Chucky, right? And the, 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 the woman who is... Um, putting herself forward as the boss of the family. She gets her come up and I won't spoil it for you. She's very skillfully direct. I think uh, uh, Don Mancini himself, I think he pronounces it Mancini. So I apologize for those who, who are uh, language Nazis. Uh, I think Don Mancini himself directed Seed, Seed of Chucky. And I think for my money, that's probably the best one of them all. Um, and, um, Anyway, that's the contribution <laughs> of, uh, of uh, Rodney James Alcala. Let's see here. Yeah, the seventh installment of the series is The Cult of Chucky that came out in 2017. And I note here that there is a series to be released in 2021. You know I'm going to be all over it. And I, you know, as usually happens, it's typically not up to snuff of the original visions. But if Don Mancini's creative vision is kept intact, in other words, if he has a hand in it, I think it's going to be good. It's definitely something that I'm going to check check out here. Now, let me conclude then with why the so-called serial killer phenomenon. Well, as I lay out in historical terms in my essay, uh, Empire of Death, I pin it down to the post-Vietnam War period, the period in which over 2 million Vietnamese, Cambodian, Laotian civilians were killed by the U.S. corporate military machine, in addition to being experimented on by these transgenetic CBWs, like we know it as Agent Orange, it's called dioxin, uh, courtesy of uh, the Dow Chemical Company, which recruits still, you know, on campus, including UC Davis, they used to come and uh, recruit uh, people out of the engineering school, right, to, to fill up the the ranks of people to uh, make uh, CBWs. And now they're going into molecular chemistry uh, and uh, neuro neuroengineering to because, you know, they've been found out. People know about Monsanto. They know about Dow. So they're going from nuclear to nucleus warfare. They're going molecular, right? And but we're, I'm telling you now, so you know, we know, we're not going to be caught unawares. We're not going to wait 30 years to find out about all these uh, health problems and genetic problems that are going to be uh, occurring down 
down the line when when the perpetrators are already dead and gone and safely have squirreled away the billions of dollars that they have made uh, on our on the basis of, of our health and our sanity. So that's how I tie it into the serial killer phenomena. It didn't really start happening into the 70s. Uh, then it became a thang, which it is today. Now it's a YouTube phenomenon. Everybody's doing uh, serial killers and true crime on, on, on iTunes. It's going to be a challenge for me to go beyond the same old, same old, and to really push the boundaries out on true crime. And if there's anybody that's able to do it with the background, the experience, and the know-how, and the cultural forensics method, and the support of you, the live stream people, as well as the thousands who are going to watch this, yeah, there are thousands who are watching every one of these shows. YouTube is suppressing the numbers, right? Because they think, well, how good can it be? His number, his view numbers are pretty low. But you can bet your bottom dollar there are thousands more, maybe tens of thousands, that are watching this show and others like it. And I have it on good authority. I'm not very far from, from Silicon Valley where all the, with the epicenter of all this. And I have many, many generations now, like going back to at least 20 years of students at UC Davis who work at these places. And I'm in close touch with them, right? They tell me what the hell is going on at these places. And they say, Professor, you were you were right on, man. We were we just kind of laughed at it, you know, at, amongst ourselves. Not wow, you're really crazy. That's pretty wild stuff. Until we hit uh, entered the workforce and found out you was right. Yeah, I know you were right, but I'm using Faulknerian language. You was right. Uh, if you want, want a one volume explication of this phenomenon of serial killers, I can recommend it's not well written, but that's really doesn't matter. The meaning is there. I could recommend a book. I've done it before. David M. Sylvie, S-I-L-V-E-Y. I checked. It's still available on Bezos.com. Uh, it's titled Project Artichoke. Zodiac was a cover for silencing witnesses from the RFK assassination, published 2010. I know the person who claims that she helped write it, if not ghost write it, but that's neither here nor there. Check out the book. I don't think it goes far enough. Uh, Sylvie claims that Zodiac Killer, which was up here in Northern California, not far from where I am, the East Bay, Lake Berryessa, he says it was a cover for killing the, cleaning them up, the witnesses from the RFK. I think it, it's not just RFK. I think it's cleaning up, silencing witnesses from any number of different, not just assassinations, but they learned something, let's say, at the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory or at the DNC, or maybe at the State House of, you know, pick your favorite New World Order Center, Maryland, let's say. That's how they, these uh, synthetic assassins uh, are used um, in, in, broad, in the broadest terms. That's how I'm approaching this, this phenomenon. So those of you who are, uh, who are the uh, YouTube click, clickbait artists, who are looking at this is just for its purely sensational uh, aspect. You're you're doing a disservice to your viewers who who most for the most part lack the discernment to figure it out. Uh, whereas I am trying to avert the next wave of uh, psyops and uh, killings that uh, have been rolled out almost continuously since the end of World War II against the American people that these agencies purport to be protecting. Well, who's going to protect us from the Pentagon slash NATO caliphate? We are. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for bearing with me. Dave Underdown, under I'm sorry, Dave Underdown, Detroit Dave. Yeah, I want to ask you about the Nederlander family of Detroit. Yeah, right. They're in the theatrics, right? And we're talking about synthetic theater. So thank you very much for joining me. We'll see you on Thursday. Thanks again, everybody. Peace.